uh, turn over to our uh, chair of the New York section, uh, Mr. Jeff Cohen. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Wes, and welcome everyone. We have 45 attendees at this time. Welcome uh, once again to the March 2021 section meeting entitled Use of Technologies to Transport Video over Public Domain Internet Using the Latest Technologies. And of course, we're talking about RIST and SRT when we say that. We always open by thanking our sponsors. Uh, this year, due to the pandemic, uh, we didn't ask our sponsors to re-up. They all got a free year of sponsorship for the fee they paid back in 2020, so congratulations. But especially thanks to B&H Photo, our anchor uh, sponsor, who continue to fund us uh, in great proportion. And we ask you to please uh, uh, pay attention to our vendors and our sponsors and uh, use them uh, in your systems when you can. So uh, you can become a friend's sponsor nonetheless uh, by contacting Carl Cavagnolo and Carl's phone number and his, his uh, email address are there uh, on the screen. Uh, we do depend on sponsorship to uh, sustain us financially and we appreciate your support in that endeavor. Uh, most folks who are on this call right now, I hazard to guess, uh, as usual, are not members of the SMPTE. Uh, so uh, there are various levels of membership, including student memberships, associate memberships, professional memberships, and executive memberships at different price points. They all have uh, their own benefits. Uh, you can visit SMPTE.org for the details, but uh, especially now during the pandemic where uh, membership organizations are being challenged. Uh, renewals have been uh, difficult in the community at large. Uh, so we ask for your sustaining support by keeping your membership active. And if you're not currently a membership, a member, please join SEMTI or consider joining. I'm now going to introduce Anthony Click, sales manager, Eastern Region for Cobalt Digital. And uh, we've already met Wes uh, with LearnIPVideo.com, who is uh, running the, uh, the show here tonight, technically, as he has been doing. Thank you, Wes. But Anthony is producing this evening's meeting and uh, has done all the organizing. Thank you very much. And I'm going to toss to Anthony at this point. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Wes, for getting this all put together on short order, which it was. And thanks to uh, Brian and Ciro for uh, contributing tonight's data. I'm gonna kick this right over to Brian Nelson of Alpha Video and we'll launch into SRT and NDI. Thanks for the introduction, Anthony, and thanks Simpty New York for the invitation to present to you guys and gals today. I know it's probably dinner for most of you, so grab your cheeseburger and sit back and relax for about an hour. Again, my name is Brian Nelson. I'll be covering a few case studies using SRT and NDI and even a little bit of AWS CDI for those of you who have heard of that new protocol. So I'll start with a quick 30 second introduction of who Alpha Video is. So we are located in Minnesota. We have about 90 plus staff. Um, we started in 1970, so we just celebrated our 50th year anniversary in 2020. I've been with Alpha Video since 1992. It's about 29 years now. So we're a systems integrator. We're located out of Minnesota, as I mentioned. We, we sell a lot of the products that you guys are more than familiar with. So just a quick recap and not to belabor this one too much. I know that you guys mostly know what SRT is, but just in case you don't. So SRT stands for Secure Reliable Transport. It's a video over IP protocol for the public internet. It includes forward error correction and AES encryption. It was developed by High Vision and it's an open SDK. So there's many manufacturers in our industry that support the protocol. Just to compare that against a quick recap of NDI, which stands for Network Device Interface, it's compressed video over a gigabit ethernet network. So people ask me sometimes, which is better, SRT or NDI? And it's kind of like, which is better, a cheeseburger or a pickup truck? They're very two different type of protocols for two different type of applications. SRT is for transport, NDI is more suited for live production environments. In addition to transporting video, NDI gives us a few other things like auto discovery, so if I plug a camera onto a network, it's automatically discovered by the other NDI sources on the network, so I don't have to punch in any IP addresses. Also supports things like pan tilt, camera control, tally, under monitor display metadata, and things like that. 
It was developed, of course, by our friends at NewTek. And again, it's an open SDK, just like SRT. So now we've gone through that, let's kind of jump into our first use case. Um, we're going to cover what, how we used SRT in the 2020 NFL draft. And maybe some of you have seen this portion of the presentation. But as you guys remember, about a year ago was when the country went into lockdown and the NFL draft happened in April. So really the NFL had a short time frame to figure out how they were going to pull this event, if they were going to pull it off at all. Um, so the idea was to send iPhone 11s to remote contributors home and backhaul them into their infrastructure, which is AWS in this case, using SRT. They also needed to create NDI multi-viewers that needed to be sent out to a bunch of remote production staff and talent. But at the end of the day from AWS, we needed to deliver live SDI outputs for the broadcast control room. So as much as this was a hybrid production, part of it was all running out of Amazon, and then part of it was a traditional SDI-based control room with a tr traditional broadcast control room. So for those, those, for those of you who've seen it, uh, this is what it looked like on air. These are iPhone 11 feeds coming in SRT. These were referred to as their always on camera feeds, which is basically a POV camera. From a high level, this is what this looked like. And we're gonna kind of zero in on the upper right-hand portion of this where you see AWS with the red circle around and we're gonna focus on these always on cameras coming from like GMs and head coaches and such. We were partnered with a company called Van Wagner, who was actually running the operations for this. Oh, yeah. Let's drill down into what this looked like. So on the left-hand side, we see the iPhone 11s. And as scary as this is, we use the free Larix Broadcaster app, which is available for iOS and Android, which turns your smartphone into an SRT transmitting device. Even more scarier, we took that across the public internet into AWS. Once we got SRT into AWS, we converted all to NDI. So as I like, like I mentioned before, NDI is very well suited in a production environment. So the quickest we could get it to NDI, the better. We created a bunch of multi-viewers then that got sent out to remote production staff. We also put in an NDI router so the remote staff could view any of the multi-viewers that was running in the cloud. They could uh, route their isolated camera sources or whatever they wanted to their houses or to their facilities. Up here at the top, you see an NDI cloud node. And I know I mentioned before, NDI does not traverse the public internet very well, but there are some tools out there that allow us to do that from several manufacturers. So here we use an NDI cloud node and encapsulates the NDI sources that exist in AWS and actually sent them across the public internet to an on-prem server running a cloud node just on an off-the-shelf HP server. That got us the NDI outputs we needed, ran it through a couple of more HP off-the-shelf servers with a couple of black magic cards, and that gave us 16 SDI outputs that could run into the production switcher. So what is the processing engine? Some of you guys might own one, some of you guys might never have heard of one. Um, I call it the Swiss Army Knife of IP video. So it supports inputs from NDI, SRT, RIST, MPEG, Transport, Stream, just about every flavor of IP protocol out there um, and outputs the same codecs as well. There's a bunch of different modules in there for video and audio ingest, distribution, conversion, multi-viewers, recorders, delays, and such. It runs in a web browser, so it's remotely managed, and there's just a list of modules, and I just drag these out into this web-based canvas. From there, I just kind of drag these, we call them virtual SDI noodles between my processing modules to create some custom signal flows. Now, I know that this one's going to be kind of an eye chart for most of you through Zoom, um, but this is the processing engine layout that was running for the draft. So we see all the coaches and GMs cameras coming in on the left as SRT sources. We put in a quick little failover switch in case their camera dropped out, and then we're running it into a bunch of multi -view. We also leveraged, I mentioned the NDI router. So it's a software-based IP orchestration router um, that runs either from software-based router control panels. This one up here on the right is the one we used for the draft. So we see the 64 coaches cameras and we see the 16 SDI outputs that we're feeding the control room. And you can control it from various different, you know, Blackmagic control panels or Elgato stream decks and things like that. So this is what it looked like um, at Van Wagner in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, you can see his beautiful 49 inch super ultra wide display with his browser open with the processing engine signal flow. From processing engine, we had two 32 bit multi-viewers that are running up above that. You can kind of maybe see that there's some blue and pink boxes in there. That's the failover switch. So if it didn't see an iPhone 11, 
feed coming in, it went back to the failover switch. This picture was taken as rehearsals were starting. So this is just when all the iPhone 11s were starting to come online. <clears throat> so that's the draft. The next case study we're going to go over uses NDI and SRT, and this is decentralized live cloud production. And I know that this is going to be kind of a tough pill to swallow for a lot of you. We'll kind of work through where everything that's on this uh, drawing. But let's start off in the upper left-hand corner. This is not vaporware. This is widely deployed. We have many customers using this. Um, it hasn't been, this came to fruition during COVID, um, but since then there's dozens of installations out there for this. So on the upper left-hand corner in this gray box, we see a traditional studio or remote venue where I've got some SDI sources and maybe some NDI sources. I've converted my SDI sources to NDI, and then I've used that cloud node that I mentioned to encapsulate this network, send it across the public internet. In this case, delivering it into an AWS instance. But you can put cloud nodes wherever you want, so I can deliver this to multiple remote venues, multiple uh, remote studios. Um, and then down in here, there's an interesting thing. This is the Viz Vector Plus, and some of you guys may have heard of this. I call it AKA the TriCaster in the cloud. So what Viz, as you guys know, Viz purchased and owns New Tech, and not owns New Tech, but I guess they merged. So Viz took the TriCaster and made it as a software subscription that you can deploy in your own cloud instance. So the Viz Vector Plus is up to a 44 input 8ME switcher with up to four channels of Viz graphics running in the cloud. So all our NDI sources from our remote venues are brought into AWS. We have a switching mechanism and graphics mechanism in here. We've combined this with the NDI router, of course the processing engine, and then in addition to our remote venues coming in via cloud, I can also take in, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, contributors via Unite. This is like a WebRTC plugin. And the processing engine can take direct feeds from both SRT and RIST. And then from processing engine, we can go direct OTT delivery out to either SRT, RIST, um, RTMP for your favorite CDN, or go directly out to YouTube or Facebook Live. So how do we produce this? It's all in the cloud. So in this case, we've got some people working from home, which has been most popular during COVID. This could be a actual control room somewhere that has a monitor wall and a production switcher interface, like I showed on here, a two stripe or a four stripe control surface that's actually tied to the cloud. So this could be a control room or everybody working from home, but we see the remote director using TerraDC to connect to the vector. We see remote graphics producer, director that needs to see a multi-viewer and maybe use the Blackmagic uh, Smart Video Hub to control the router. So that's kind of decentralized NDI production. I quickly mentioned the Unite contribution module. I mean, as probably a lot of you guys have had to struggle with is how to get single source remote contributor people from web camera into your production. And we've all used Skype talk shows and they do work great. Sometimes people have used Teams and NDI People have used Zoom and all sorts of different tools to bring in contributors. So the Unite contribution module, it's kind of like WebRTC, but a little bit different, is I send a link out to my remote contributor. They get that in email, they click on it. It opens up their Chrome browser, ask them if they want to use their web camera and their microphone. They say yes. They're presented with this web interface on the right-hand side. Oops, my mouse got a little happy. This interface on the right in their browser, they can see their outgoing feed and a start and stop broadcasting. They get a live tally. And then from the processing engine, we can actually send a program return back to them, any source that's in processing engine. So it could be a quad multi-viewer program, clean feed. It could actually be a prompter feed. And if you look at the module, we're coming into Sienna Unite and we're breaking apart the video and the audio. And I'm running the audio in the intercom module. And because we have AES 67 and Dante capabilities, I can actually tie in producer and IFB audio into the return video that's going into their browser. So you kind of see an IFB module here where I'm taking my intercom audio in, I have my program audio in, and I can either do a mix between the two or I can actually do a voice interrupt. And then from there, it goes into the output module and the output module is what feeds the return feed. So we're gonna move on to case study three remote broadcast monitoring using NDI. And this would be for production and master control operations. So in this case, you take your favorite Everts Imagine Utah router. We're taking some SDI feeds. We convert them to NDI. We go through this processing engine 
And this processing engine sends out what we call Scanalink, and it's a way to take NDI and send it across the public internet in a very low latency feed. And there's some free player apps that I'll mention in a little bit. Um, and this is how the remote, this could be a Crispin operator, ITX operator that needs to see his multi-viewers and he's running master control from home. Surprisingly enough, we've had some people do ROTS overdrive from home and need to get all their feeds from their house. Uh, and this is all running in off the shelf hardware with a simple eight channel black magic card converting the SDI feeds into NDI. So this is kind of what it looks like. The picture on the right would be a, a remote at home um, master control operator, TD or something else. They're getting a quad split multi-viewer. They got a router control panel in the background. I mentioned before, there's free player apps to view this video on Windows, Mac, iPad, iPhone. There's actually a free app in the tvOS store so that you could take an Apple TV, download a free app, slap it on the back of a monitor and send a feed to it. Um, and it is about a six, six to 18 megabit feed that comes out of it. And it does offer one AES-128 encryption and passphrase, much like the SRT Kodak does. Um, in this particular customer's case study, uh, we're taking 40 SDI feeds, converting it to NDI, and I didn't have enough room in here, but they had 20 remote operators at home. So this can scale up pretty large if you needed to. So next, um, we're going to go through uh, remote editing. So as you guys know, everybody talks about NDI and is used for live production. There is a very cool feature in both Avid Media Composer and most of the Adobe suite. So we're talking Adobe Premiere, After Effects, Adobe Character Animator, the ability to take NDI directly from your nonlinear editing system timeline, which is a great feature. Um, so in this case, across the top, we see all our edit base, Avid or Adobe, these edit bays are sending NDI across the local area network and using the processing engine, we can send that to at-home editors or client producer over the shoulder applications or other collaborators. And some people say, well, geez, I have Grass Valley Edius or I have Final Cut or I'm using DaVinci Resolve and I don't have NDI output. You can use a simple $400 throwdown converter and convert NDI or convert SDI coming from the timeline in the edit bay to NDI and send that down the same signal path. From there, we use Cinelink. We use the free apps, as I mentioned, at home to view this stuff or Apple TVs if they want. The other cool feature of this, and Philadelphia Eagles um, use this, and the production manager says, I now have more. Well, so what he did is he used processing engine to create a multi viewer of all his editors. So at home, he can sit there and watch all his edit bays, edit in real time, which gives him more visibility than what he had when he was actually on-prem in his office and everybody's in their dark edit bays. Then we've had some people want to take their 24 inch Sony Trinitron monitor home with SDI inputs, and they want to edit at home while they're remotely editing their Avid system a thousand or a hundred miles away, but they want to see an SDI full resolution preview output. So because we're using NDI, passing this through the processing engine, it adds forward error correction, recompresses it to get across the public internet. But when it gets to the person's house, it can reflect NDI across their own home network. So much like we used a Magwell or a Nutech Spark or a converter to the edit bay to get to NDI, we can use the same decoder to go NDI to SDI, and then they can plug that into their favorite Sony or Kagami TV Logic production model. So now you say, well, geez, if we can use NDI and SRT for production control, master control, we can use it for our edit bays. Some of you say, well, we're doing all of that. Can we use it for all of that? So this is kind of a blended, or I call it the merged remote monitoring application. And we do have some major broadcast networks that are up and running this. Um, so in this case, we're taking, as I just recently mentioned, Adobe Premiere from NDI. We're taking some Viz engines. So as you guys know, Chiron, and Ross Expression all have NDI output, plus Unreal Engine for virtual sets and things like that support native NDI output. So you can take your editorial, you can take your graphics, run in a processing engine, you can take LiveU, um, your LU2000 quad receivers that have four SDI spigots, also put out four NDI streams. So we can also take your LiveU feeds and run it through here. And we're taking some baseband in and out. And we're also, because we can take SRT in and out, we can now remote monitor some of our SRT feeds. And then go across the public internet with the free apps. We can view it and with router, you can select whatever sources you want. And processing engine, because it does SRT output, we can come out of processing engine and actually deliver to remote high vision decoders as well. So we're getting close to the last slide, so bear with me for one more second. 
So this is kind of the merged monitoring application, but we're going to throw a cloud into the scenario and say, why in the world would you want to do this? And there are great reasons to do this. So what we've done is taken all the local NDI sources, piped them all up into Amazon, and now all my remote viewers are viewing out of the AWS instances or the Azure instances, instead of these remote viewers all taking a bandwidth that's coming into your local area network. The other more key feature to this whole thing is the processing engine I alluded to before supports the new AWS CDI. Um, and that's a way within AWS to connect uncompressed SDI type video signals between instances across manufacturers. So I could go, now once I got all my feeds into AWS and I can share them with an EBS slow motion system, with a Grass Valley virtualized production system or any other vendor, you know, yet to be announced that's jumping on the CD, CDI bandwagon, that'll be able to pass uncompressed video between manufacturer and between AWS instances. So I just threw up a slide in case you guys want to screenshot it or Google it. I mean, I think that this CDI interface is kind of, kind of just like all the other Kodaks we've had up until now, it's going to be another change in our industry. So, but that is the end of my presentation. Um, and I believe this was fairly early in your presentation. Um, I think when you were talking about the uh, the NFL. Yeah. Um, it says, was this 100% public internet to AWS or was it using virtual private circuit on AWS? Uh, it was public internet to AWS. Okay, 100% for all? Yeah, I mean, it gets... One thing my slide didn't show is that there was a high vision media gateway system where everybody's SRT feeds was coming in, went through a high vision media gateway, and then went SRT back out of the high media, high vision media gateway into our processing engine. But all the iPhones went directly to AWS over public internet, which there's lots of funny stories about how that all went. <laughs> Um, and imagine. actually, it was an open internet connection between AWS and North Carolina Raleigh, where we got the SDI outputs, which, which, which were then fed fiber um, to ESPN for the control room. And Friday night, we, there, AT&T had a, had a router failure in North Carolina while we were doing the production. And we had some sacrificed internet data rates as they got through that, but we still made it through. We went from six frames of latency, we moved it up to 20 frames of latency to give us a little bit more buffering. Okay. So um, I, I, I personally had a question. So what is the um, the end-to-end -end latency when you're doing NDI conversion and wrist uh, in and out and all, and maybe back to the, uh, to the Sony monitor? It sounds like when you're talking about editing, you're not, you're not talking about you're not talking about live production switching. You're talking about highlights and things like that, grabbing. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? No. What so is the latency? We, we can take SDI um, from on-prem, encode it to NDI, or take NDI that's already NDI, run it through mm -hmm. a cloud node, transcode it, deliver it into AWS or another remote location, decode it back to base demand SDI in under six frames of latency. So that's, six a fifth of a, six, that's a fifth of a second. So you can round trip in about a half a second. And that was allowing uh, enough time for the SRT buffering? Um, well, in this case, we're not using SRT. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's so a little trick and I didn't go into that much detail. Um, we used a Kodak called Scanalink, okay? And you know, uh -huh. yep. gotcha. some of you guys might understand this. So SRT is a wrapper. It's a protocol. It right. doesn't necessarily define the video payload. I could put UDP, MPEG transport stream. So what the guys at Gallery Sienna who happened to make this processing engine product, what they did is they took SRT and extracted the regular video payload and inserted a custom Kodak inside the SRT wrapper. So it's delivered like SRT, but the video inside is not recognizable to any other SRT device. Mm -hmm. To another cloud node or to the CN Link player apps, they all know how to decode it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I'm not saying it's better than SRT. I mean, it's a very proprietary codec that they use for it. So it's not, some, it's right. meant to go between their products and their players. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And then we had uh, two more questions. We'll just cover those real quick and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go, go back to um, Anthony and Cyril. First question, what, what were the typical NDI bit rates 
you were using in these in these use cases? I think you said 100 megabit or? Well, so NDI, as most of you probably know, regular 1080i is between 125 megabit for NDI. That's why it does not traverse the public internet at all. And it doesn't uh -huh. have any forward error correction. In these other workflows, like let's say through a cloud node where we take 100 megabit NDI and we're going to send 12 feeds across the public internet. We usually go down much like a live view backpack down to six megabit, 10 megabit, whatever you can tolerate for your internet connection. And NDI, I mean, New Tech was kind of genius in the way that they developed with NDI is there's automatic announcements across NDI devices that say that the camera is available, but if I'm not using our program or preview, it doesn't send me the full resolution video. Mm -hmm. NDI is always sending this low resolution proxy or multi-viewer thumbnail that they're sending. So I have video feed, but if I want the full payload, it triggers the camera to send me the full payload. So right. we have customers that may have nine remote PTZ cameras at a remote site, but they're only sending three or four NDI signals at any one given time. They don't need all 12 at one time. Makes so I mean, perfect sense. 50, 50 megabit connections, 100 megabit connections. I mean, if we have a large scenario, you know, like what I talked about that merge scenario, I mean, there are cases where you need a 10 gig connection from your facility AWS, and we've done that as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, last question um, from Ian McSpaden. Uh, does delay latency vary depending on distance between locations? How do you account for retries on connections that have many hops? Yeah, so obviously it's the internet and yes, the delay can vary depending on instances. I have seen, I have seen less than two frames of latency and anybody else who's used SRT and high vision Makitos and other everybody else's encoders and decoders. There are times where you get extremely low latencies and then there's sometimes there's higher. You know, the one thing about the Sienna link codec that, that I mentioned earlier is every time there's a trade-off, if you're losing bandwidth and you can't deliver all your packets, what happens to your codec? And the one thing Sienna does a little bit different than their Kodak from anybody else is they will always maintain resolution before they will maintain um, frame rate. So it's always the prettiest picture and then they'll stop dropping frames if the oh, is sacrificed, right? Some people macro block, some people do all kinds of other things, but they literally drop frames, which makes it really conducive for that remote editing workflow that if I'm scrubbing my timeline in Avid and I'm sending out thousands of frames and I'm scrubbing it, if it can't keep up with the thousand of frames coming through it, it's just dropping out which ones it can't make. And for the at-home editor, they don't see any difference. All right, very good. Well, back to you, Anthony. Thank you, Wes, and thank you, Brian. Brian, that yeah, was thank you, everybody. a very nice presentation and informative. At this point, let's turn this over to Ciro Nerona, who will tell us all about RIST and what it can do for you. Ciro, Hi. take it away. Thank you, Anthony. So my talk is gonna be a little bit different from uh, uh, Brian's because we are gonna go down to technical details. Uh, we had this uh, RIST webinar about end of, end of February that uh, touched on use cases. You can find that on the RIST YouTube channel. So a little bit of, about me. Uh, this is when I could have uh, get haircuts. I got, it's a little bit different now. Uh, and I'm here uh, pre pretty much representing the RISC forum, basically the, the, the RISC AG. Just jumping into this, um, if you've heard about RISC and you've heard about the, the, RISC, the, the RISC forum. So RISC is an activity group inside the, the video services forum. That's what, as where the RISC specifications, the tech work is done. Um, and then there's the RISC forum, which is the kind of the marketing organization. So uh, that comes and promotes and educates uh, about RIST. So the RIST AG, the, the co-chairs are uh, Rick Ackermans and our very own Webs, Wes Simpson. And uh, I'm pres the president of the RIST forum. Informally, I work also as the editor of the RIST specifications. So the RIST forum is an industry group and there is currently, well, last time I looked at 127 companies, but, but that changes on a daily basis. So that's, that's the players in this, in this thing. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? Um, I want to use the internet as a cost-effective means of transporting high quality broadcast grade video, which we all know is possible, quite possible, right? But the uh, delivery of the internet is not guaranteed, so the video may glitch. Um, I need to use my link or any combination of links anywhere to move my content. 
There's solutions out there that do that, but many of them add a lot of latency, which is not useful for live. Also, I need my content to get protected so it doesn't get stolen, right? It's valuable, needs to be protected. Uh, uh, related thing is that bad people shouldn't be able to hijack my feed that send that content inside of mine. You send a reporter in the field, reporter has to send video back to the station. So it has to be the reporter, not someone else, right? Uh, and finally, my IT people are very busy. This needs to be uh, simple and straightforward to set up. So you all know that many, many people's ha people have solutions like this. Why is this different? RIST was designed as a joint effort between many of the, the leading companies that provide video delivery of the internet. So basically what happened is ESPN, I believe, came, came to the RIST forum and said, yeah, there's solutions like that. They don't talk to each other. Please clean the house. So Video Services Forum created a, an AG and, and look, all the leading companies join that and freely share their experience. So we, we selected best of class technologies in every aspect of the protocol. But the final result is this, I'm not peddling any equipment from anybody here, is that you have the choice to select the best equipment from whatever vendor you want, and you're not locked to a single vendor. And you, you are you are guaranteed that number one, inter interoperates, and number two, you're not, not have, making any compromises in terms of quality or protocols or anything. So let's talk about the risk roadmap. So we started with something called Risk Simple Profile, which was released in 2018. And what Simple Profile does for you is ARQ, basically uh, retransmission of lost packets, retransmission throttling, and very, very important, link aggregation and redundant paths. And I will, I'll talk some more about that. So that, that came out in 2018. In 2020, we released something called Main Profile, which adds tunneling and basically all the security stuff. And now we are working on something called the Advanced Profile, which basically will allow you to use RIST for pretty much as a transport, pretty much anything you want. So lossless compression, payload identification. We're also looking at things like uh, receiver synchronization where you send multiple encoders to multiple decoders and they all play synchronized. So what's in risk simple profile? Let's go just des describe that. There, you have basic compatibility with the non-risk systems using the standard RTP as the base protocol. So that's one thing we, we built it on top of RTP, which is a standard protocol. We use uh, NAC-based ARQ, we, some of us got Emmys for that. NAC-based ARQ, which is not a big deal. You lost the packet, you re request it, and it gets retransmitted. So uh, only the lost packets are resent. And you can use that together with FEC. This is a much better method than FEC, but you can use it together with FEC. And so the features of that is that's bandwidth efficient, which is an advantage of FEC, and you have a tunable trade-off between latency and protection. The other thing it does is multi-link support. You can do uh, bonding and, and uh, also seamless switching, redundant links, and IP multicast support. So since this is a tech presentation, I'm going to dive into the tech details for you. The, the base stream is sent using standard RTP. So you have baseline compatibility with non-risk devices. Uh, just like in SEMTI 2022 FAC, you have baseline compatibility with non-risk devices. You, you have it here too. Uh, the sender transmits periodic RTCP messages to establish uh, states in the firewall. And the receiver also transmits periodic RTCP messages to, to keep the return channel. We also have an echo message to uh, measure latency. Um, if the packets are lost, the RTCP NAC messages are sent and we use RFC 4585 bitmask NACs. So uh, pretty much everything standard with a custom risk NAC range for block losses. So you have a protocol for salt and pepper losses and a protocol for block losses. Multi-link operation, it, that's very important. You can use multiple lips in parallel for a, a given stream. And we have two modes of operation. One is bonding, 
which is what the, the, those cell bonding guys do. You, you, stream the, you split the stream between the links and you combine the capacities of the stream. So you, you basically combine the links. The other uh, mode is seamless switching, which is you replicate the streams and the receiver merge the, the packets. This is SAMPT 2022-7. It's not like SAMPT 2022-7. It's exactly SAMPT 2022-7. And this being a SAMPT meeting, I, I, I think you guys will like that fact. So if one of the links fails, there is no glitch. It's exactly seamless switching from 2022-7 built into RIST. All right, let's go to main profiles. And I hope I'm not talking too fast here, but we'll have time for questions at, at, at the end. So simple profile gets it there. And main profile protects it. So the first thing is encryption. You protect your high value streams in flight over the internet. The second thing is authentication. You make sure that the endpoint, up, the, the, the other endpoint is who you think they are. Is that thing I talk, talk, talked about, is it the reporter that's talking to you or is it someone else? And the final thing is tunneling. You can use the risk connection to um, tunnel. So simple profile requires UDP. You can have, if you have two ports. So if you have lots of streams, it, it's only, uh, you would need lots of ports, but with main profile is a single port. And the most important thing is you can have non-risk traffic for inband control. The technician can, a technician can ride the connection back and manage the equipment. So if you have like an encoder in a van and you need to adjust it, the, the the technician can write that and, and uh, configure it if you have to. And uh, another thing for a really simple uh, main profile is you have scenarios with high bitrate latency and further bandwidth opt optimization. All right, so the tunneling and multiplexing, let's, let's talk about that. We used, uh, use only one UDP port. So only one thing gets configured in the firewall. Only one encryption session is needed, and the session can be initiated by, uh, by either tunnel endpoint. So that's, that's the tunneling part. And the tunnel is bit by direction. So you can have one risk connection for multiple streams and use the same infrastructure for inband traffic, inband control. So you can do SNMP, web, or any other management traffic over a risk tunnel. What's the technology since it's a technical talk? We, are, we have selected GRE over UDP RFC 8086 for the tunneling. So it's, it's very, very standard. And you have two modes. You have a full datagram mode, which where you send a complete layer three packet. Um, you, can, you can transport end-to-end -end addresses and post as some important in some, uh, in some conditions. It, and it, that's how you transport any IP packets. And the overhead of that is just 2.4%, it's 32 bytes. We also defined a reduced overhead mode where only UDP source destination ports are included and the, the overhead there is about 0.6%. So only eight bytes. Risk main profile content protection. So we selected something called DTLS, the data, Datagram Transport Layer Security, which is really the same uh, technology that is used in the web today is the datagram version of the TLS technology that you use to connect through your web browser to, to your bank. Uh, the important thing with uh, crypto is that something is, that's mature and well vetted. So something that has gone to the ringer and people have looked at it and um, vetted it. So that we can never claim that uh, the, the, uh, never claim that there isn't uh, holes, but people, uh, the, the experts have vetted it, and they they it, it's what's in use today. So uh, and you can select multiple ciphers. That's that's important. You can can select a level of of uh, uh, crypto. The TLS is applied to the tunnel. So again, since this is a technical talk, I'm going to talk about cipher suits. Um, and those include AES-128. So you can use AES-128 and you can use AES-256. Why we offer the two is because in some places of the world, 256 is illegal. So you have to use 128. In some other places, they were like here, if you go and say AES-128, people are gonna laugh at you. They don't think it's secure enough. 
and there's an optional no encryption fallback. It's a good compromise between encryption strength and ability to adhere to local, local requirements. And the individual vendors can add to the list. So can, if you want to use ChaCha, for example, it's, it's supported. Authentication. Are you who you think, who I think you are? And we use certificate-based authentication, which is the same technology that's been used to authenticate bank websites. Um, when you connect to your bank, you, you, you are sure that they are connecting to your bank because of certificate. We use the same, same technology, but in this case, in risk, both server and client can authenticate each other. The user is in full control and you, have, you can have a whitelist. We can have a whitelist, we can use a private CA, it's all, all supported. And we also support this password-based authentication, TLS SRP, if you don't need all of that. Um, next thing is uh, pre-shared key operation. That's very important for things like satellite because it's one-to-many. This is crypto one-to-many, which no other uh, standards are supporting. So same AS128. Pre-shared passphrase, this is similar to what uh, the SRT guys do for crypto, where you use a passphrase, but you support rotating keys and on the flight change of the, of the price phrase with the advantage of being if it being one-to-many. It's uh, suitable for one-to-many and unidirectional environments, and we have people using that as satellite replacement. Other risk main profile features, bandwidth optimization using no packet deletion in the case is a transport stream and high bitrate extensions. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the details of that. You just need to know that those things are there. Standards MRFC is used in RIST. RIST, uh, our AG chairman, uh, Rick Ackerman, used to, likes to, to say it's the Lego approach. You take the parts of the standards that you need and you put them together. So RIST is based on a whole bunch of standards and RFCs. And this is the full list. I'm not gonna read it to you. I just want you to keep in mind that RIST is built on top of existing standards and it is an industry specification that's coming out of the video services forum. Open source. Uh, some of the things you saw today like RIST and NDI open SDK, there is open source RIST. There's something called LibRIST. You can go get it. It's built also into GStreamer, UPipe, and, FF in, and uh, FFmpeg uh, port is done. You can have it in VLC, and people have contributed uh, Wireshark tools, Wireshark plugins to analyze risk if you have to go fault find. How well does it work? Here's a, here's a plot from uh, the ITC evaluation from uh, 2019. This is my paper. It's in the Cobalt website. You can, you can go as high as 30 to 50% packet loss. That's the high end of this, this curve here. And uh, RISC2 works, works there unlike other protocols. With 200% uh, overhead, you can, you can support, uh, you can sustain 250% uh, packet loss. Now, the actual protocol for 50% packet loss is for you to pick up the phone and call the IT guy and say, fix it. But, Risk can do that for you. Here's an example of a performance snapshot. We had a risk demo in, uh, uh, during a virtual NAB. And this is an example of 86% burst loss. And this is not the same vendor in both sides. This is actually a cobalt stream going to a video flow receiver. Uh, and you can see here that there was an instantaneous 86% packet loss but no one recovered packets, so they all recovered. So that's the kind of performance you can get from risk, best of class. All right, you wanna read about that because I talked too fast and, and PowerPoint was acting on me, they threw me off a little bit. Uh, you can download the technical specifications for the VSF website, it's open spec. You can go download the spec, you can, um, check out the risk activity group webpage. You're gonna see Wes's uh, picture over there. Um, you can go to the risk forum website. We have events, case studies, lots of case studies. Uh, we have talks, recorded talks. And um, if you wanna see that plot, the risk performance evaluation, that's available in the Cobalt website and the white, white papers. I, I made a little nice uh, uh, small URL for that, but it's in the, the Cobalt webpage. If you want to watch stuff, 
Uh, this first one is a risk promo video. It's a nice one minute, uh, very fluffy thing, but it's, hey, the, the music is, is, uh, is catchy, right? Uh, if you want the details on how ARQ works, I, I have that. It's a, it's a YouTube video I prepared. If you want to see all the trade show demos, all this, these vendors working together, there's a playlist for that. And you can go to the Risk Farm YouTube channel. There's lots and lots of talks in there, with lots of presentations. And that's that. Um, I apologize for some of my technical issues of, uh, of PowerPoint going by itself here. So, so Sarah, thank you a lot. Uh, and we, and we, we know that the um, glitches you were having were PowerPoint based and not because you were losing packets. So uh, <laughs> yes. I, I think, we're, I think we're, we're safe in saying that. Um, so uh, first question here was um, what tools would be good to learn and own to best manage risk? Okay, so depends on what, uh, what you, what you want to do with it. So I think the bet, if you want to play with risk, the best thing to do is go get Librist, which is the public domain version of RISC. There is a talk by Sergio Mirata. He did it uh, two months ago that shows you exactly how to run it. And then you can generate your own RISC stream and then play with it so you can see how well that works. So that would be the, the best thing to do. Um, if you want to just see performance, a uh, number of us have papers on, on, the, on the performance. and Many vendors have it in, in their product. But at this point, if you want to go into the details and learn more about risk, go see the talks and go see Sergio's talk if you want to actually experiment with it. And, and I, I, I can't resist the urge. I'm going to say if, um, if you're interested in a training class on risk and SRT and RTMP for that matter, uh, go to learnipvideo.com and, and there's a class available there. Um, so anyhow, uh, another question says, when bonding, is there a cost or penalty of resources that have to be accounted for? The, the only cost on bonding, when you, you, you con connect several, you combine several links, the only cost on that is latency. It's a little bit of latency because now you have to accommodate but the, the, the worst case latency differential. So if you're comparing that to a single link, all we have to do is latency, but there's no bandwidth overhead because we use RTP and the sequence numbers are already in the packet. So the only cost is an, a, a small increase in latency, latency differential, that's it. And, it, of, and isn't, it, isn't it fair to say that you're actually no worse off than your slowest link? In other words- That's right. You're not no more soft than your slowest link. Uh, you just have to do a little reorder buff, but buffer, but you're no more soft than the, the, your, your slowest link. So it is actually something that's very effective to do bonding. Okay. Um, another question here. Um, are there risk to SDI converters? That's a commercial question. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, that's called the... It's called the professional IRD with risk in it. Um, and uh, you can get that, uh, again, in the spirit of company, uh, of uh, industry group, you can go to the risk form webpage. There's many companies, many companies that offer that kind of product. It's, it's gonna be on the professional IRDs and many companies off, offer that and you can buy it uh, basically from the usual suspects. Okay. <laughs> I have a question, Wes, if I may. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this regards the uh, ATSC 3.0 STL transport protocol, which is, I guess, substantially based on, sorry, I'm going to add my video here, substantially based on the 2022-1, uh, uh, and so is RIST. So would combining RIST with uh, an STL transport protocol be redundant? Anyone? Well, RIST, RIST can, uh, the RIST advanced profile can operate, can, can carry anything on top of it. In fact, we've already defined a code, a code point for the ATSC3 STL. And, you know, it, basically any stream, anything that you can transport using RTP, you can transport using RIST. I, that, that's a fair statement, right, Cyril? Yes. 
Okay. Um, now with the uh, with ATSC three, of course they're using MMT, um, and uh, you need to be. Um, I, I don't know if there's an encapsulation for MMT over RTP or not. I, I don't know. Maybe someone in the audience does. Well, with uh, I would say that if not knowing the answer to that, which I don't. So okay. <laughs> I would say that uh, when risk advanced profile comes out, which the draft is very close to being approved at the AG level, we will be able to transport whatever you want transparently using RIST. All right. Well, we have we actually happen to have a um, an expert in the audience, Mr. Merrill Weiss. Let me just tell you the differences I think that exist between RIST and what we did in STLTP. Uh, STLTP had as a requirement that it operate over unidirectional pathways. So there could be no negotiation between the two ends. And so a big part of it, I mean, it is based on ST 2022-1 for the uh, reliability right. part yep. of it. But we had to develop our own equivalent to uh, DTLS where everything was pre-decided as to how it would work in, uh, in terms of the security. And so we made a number of choices. So it uses, uh, it uses GMAC based on AES 384 uh, as, the, as the choice there. Uh, there are a number of other decisions that we made. For instance, we chose not to encrypt because we're just about to broadcast the content anyway. What we wanted to do was prevent man in the middle attacks. And so that was a, a decision that was taken, given that this is a broadcast emission that's just about to happen. Uh, there are a number of other things of that sort. We needed to be able to update authentication keys. So there's a, a provision for key uh, distribution. There's also the ability to treat, in, it, it's running as a tunneling protocol and there's an ability to, uh, to authenticate each tunneled, and then, in other words, inner packet stream individually. And you can choose which ones to do and when to do them because each packet is signaled as to whether or not it's authenticated. So there are a number of things like that. There's also the ability uh, to add private, the, the private keys that are used as a public private key uh, infrastructure that's used for updating all the keys. Uh, based on open PGP. And oh, okay. so that's used as the long-term security because it's asymmetric and then the authentication is symmetric. Uh, and, and so it's the symmetric has a limited lifetime depending on how many uh, cipher blocks you, you process or how many times you invoke the keys and the um, the uh, open PGP, because it's asymmetric, uh, is essentially unlimited in its lifetime. Anyway, that gives you some flavor for what some of the differences are. Sounds pretty substantial. Thank you. Okay, um, so there's a question for you, Merrill. It says, did the industry decide on open or public keys? I know there was much debate. So the keys in STLTP, um, are basically the, the the keys themselves are not open. So the uh, open PGP is used to uh, transfer new authentication keys, and it's also used to transfer new new public keys when you add entities to the network. But the authentication keys themselves are protected in open PGP messages where the keys are encrypted and they're sent uh, individually encrypted to every recipient. So a big part of the initialization process is making sure that all the other entities in the network have the public keys they need 
in order to be able to communicate with the other network entities. But we do have provisions for being able to extend the network host initialization. Uh, it's based on using USB tokens as the, as the security hardware entities. And that way you can either replace a piece of equipment by moving a USB token, or you can replace a USB token by having spares and plugging in a new one if one of them fails. So it's meant to be reliable in that, in that sense as well. Yeah, and then all you gotta I hope do is that answers the, the question. Then all you gotta do is drive to the top of Mount Wilson, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Cool. Um, well, but it, it also, just by the way, because uh, we were trying to do it with unidirectional networks, uh, you can, it, it's also, um, trying to remember the right word for it, the, the data itself is in the clear. Uh -huh. It's not encrypted. So you can run transmitters that don't use the security if you want to, if you're trying to keep the cost way down. Um, there's also provision for running over multiple internet uh, um, uh, circuits, I, I guess would be the yeah. right word. Um, and, and so being able to uh, use them in parallel and pick whatever is showing up reliably. All right. So Ian, you had another question. Did you want to ask Meryl yourself or? Sorry, I didn't mean to take things over here. That's all right. Well, let, let me just let me just read this question. If Sony had pushed for private keys, did they stay public? I don't know what that means, but maybe you do. Meryl. Well, the, the, there are public, it's public key, or I guess you call it public key infrastructure. It's PKI, right? right? So uh, there's a private key that is created inside each USB token and it never is exposed. Right. So the private key uh, will be generated in the token and the token, if you try to get into it, will just self-destruct. But there is a public key that is derived from the private key and that public key can be shared even with attackers mm -hmm. and, they, and they can't break the system just using the public key. Yeah, cool. All right, so I'm just going to scrub through the chat um, and see if there's anything else. And, and that's standard public key, PKI. Yeah, yeah. Uh, perform performance. It, just yeah. like our, uh, just like all of our credit cards and all that other good stuff. Right. Okay, great. Um, so I don't see um, any more questions here. I think we answered all the ones on the Q and A. Was, uh, we answered all the ones in the chat. It was a question uh, about which Codex uh, risk supports. Uh, go ahead, Cyril. And I, I just typed the answer, but I want to say it, that RIST is Codex agnostic. Um, most of the implementations today are bearing transport streams. So whatever you, you can stick in a transport stream it will go. It's question is whether the equipment on the other side can decode it but it's been used for MPEG-2, for 64 for HVC, and RIST itself will carry stuff that's not even transposting. Cool. Um, so I'm typing an answer to a question here because it's easier uh, to type it than to write it. So the question was, what was the name of the author you mentioned for Libris? And it's Sergio Amarata. And um, you'll see the way to spell Sergio's name in the uh, in the Q and A uh, answer there. So that's good to go. Anthony, you want to bring us home here? As I unmute myself, yeah, I'd like to thank both of the presenters tonight. That was wonderful and informative. Uh, thanks to Simply for helping put this all together quickly, and thank you for everyone who tuned in tonight to listen to this. And that's all from me. So thank you, everybody, for participating. All right. Thank you, Anthony. You did a great job. Brian, Cyril, thanks a lot. Thank you. See you all later. Thank all right, you all. Bye-bye.